Muted from us. Boy, as you think about Easter and Good Friday and this Passion Week, be thinking about the words of this song and be thinking about the prayer. Near the cross, page one and other.
y'all baby. I'll speak to the Lord.
I love Jesus. Well, we can do that. I love Jesus. I can see you being a man. You want to do it? Yeah. Do it, man. Do it. Genesis 22, we read the story of Abraham and Isaac being upon the altar. 
It came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. You've got to remember that. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering instead of his son. And the Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mouth of the Lord it shall be provided. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. And God, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to be in your house tonight. God, I thank you for each person that's here. Thank you for our time of worship. Thank you for these kids and how they love these little songs. And Father, we pray that you would just help us to, to raise them up, to teach them, and to teach them about you. God, I pray that you would bless our times of Bible study. Speak to us from your word. Bless our time together. God, speak to us tonight from your word. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, I always thought that that uh, was a literary device that's very common in the Bible. And uh, the common literary device is just a couplet. And there's so many places, there's so many places in the Bible where to say two little phrases together, and they're twins. They mean the exact same thing. And so for all of those years, I thought that uh, Isaiah 9, 6 was one of those couplets. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And I just thought it was synonymous and saying the same thing. And somebody pointed out, well, I know who it was, it was my pastor. He said, man, you know I ain't talking about Christmas, don't you? I said, what you talking about? <laughs> what you talking about? He said, oh, that's, that, that son is given. That's, that's not Christmas. I said, really? He said, no, that's talking about Good Friday. And boy, I studied it. And you confirmed, you know what he said. And it came to be, you know, how I realized this, and this is what it is. And so a child is born is Christmas. And a son is given is this, is this day that we're looking at a few days from now, Good Friday. The fact that Jesus loved us so much that he gave himself for our sin. God loved us and sent us Jesus. And Jesus died for us. The son is given. And so we want to look at that phrase uh, today. That a son is given. And we want to compare it to a place in the Bible where a man was willing to have a son given. And it's an amazing story. The story of Abraham and Isaac. This story uh, in later years has totally changed my concept of Isaac. I guess you can teach an old dog new tricks, huh? Yeah. Our revival preacher at our <coughs> church said that that church had attached to an old mule and that the wagon had gone pretty good. And so I, and I am now known as the old, old mule. mule. Y'all can oh. jump on that bandwagon if you would like. Uh, if you say it right close to me, I might ninja chop you, but it's, it's okay. You know, the old mule. 
man, you can teach an old dog new tricks. And, and so, you know, I learned that, you know, this wasn't a couple of, this wasn't just two different ways to say Christmas. And that, uh, that, that all the, in the story of Abraham and Isaac, Isaac could be a giant in this story. I mean, he just really couldn't be. I'll explain that in just a minute. So we're going to look at this story. We're going to look at what was happening. And we're going to look at what, 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 what's in common between Abraham willing to sacrifice his son and what Jesus, what the Father did with Jesus. We're going to look at those things. So here's the first truth that we're going to look at. The given son. The given, we're talking about the, the son who was given. The given son were special. The given son was special. Abraham and Sarah, they had been promised a child. And man, they were way up in years, way past the ability uh, to have children. Uh, this son was special. And think about the marching orders of even what's going on in this text. When God says to him, take your son, your only son. Now, you know, he had Ishmael, so you say, why did he say his only son? This was the only son of promise. This was the only son of him and, of him and Sarah. This is, this is the son. Take your son. Your only son. What's the next phrase? The one that you love. Take your son, your only son, the one that you love. That one that you love so, so much. That son of promise. The one you waited so long for. Take him. Take him. And go sacrifice him on a mountain. Think about God. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Uh, that begotten means one of a kind, special. The, the given son was a very, very, very special son. And of course, Jesus was God's special son. A second truth that we could share and say that they might have in common is that the given son was a planned sacrifice. This wasn't just, you know, this was something that was planned. Go and I will show you a mountain. It's real reminiscent of when God told me, you know, leave your father and leave your country into a land that I will show you. You know, I, I've gone some places that I didn't know where it was at all. And for those of you that know how I got to this part of the world, I started pastoring Longview Baptist Church. When they called me up on the phone, I assumed it was in Longview, Texas. <laughs> I had no idea. And I know how dumb this is. And I'm especially going to sound dumb to y'all, so why am I telling you? Why am I telling you? But I actually put a French pronunciation on the village. Oh, French. Uh, I'm going to need you to repeat that one. Devil A. Devil A. Church from Devil A called me long if you made this church. I just assumed. I, well, you got to understand, I'm from up north. And man, I thought anything down this far was absolutely Cajun territory. And I had to be, right? So that's just how ignorant I was and where I was going. I had no idea where no Longview Baptist Church was or where no DeVille was. I've never heard of such things in my entire life. But at least I knew the name of the place. Abraham's taking off. He ain't got a clue. I mean, he don't have no clue. And I, you know, really, I guess when he got to where he was going, God said, Whoa! <laughs> That's it! Right there! That's you, you hit it, man! That's where you're supposed to be. And so, man, that takes a lot of faith to jump up and go. So this wasn't the first time Abraham jumped up and left not knowing where he was going. And so when God showed him Mount Moriah, and man, you know, I, I can get lost chasing this rabbit. I won't do that because we got stuff aged before we eat supper, but so I, you know, I'm not going to go long tonight. But I can tell you that this Mount Moriah. This is not the last time that we're going to hear about it. Mount Moriah becomes maybe the most important piece of real estate on the planet. You say, oh man, talk to us. What, what you mean? Well, after this, there was a guy named Ornan, the Jebusite, who owned this particular piece of land, this mountain. And he had a threshing floor up on the mountain, on Mount Moriah. And David, who had sinned against the people and sinned against God by, by showing off and telling the people, God gave him three choices for punishment. He took the easy way out on himself. And because of it, there was a slaughter. 70,000 people died. And he wasn't expecting that. And, you know, he just, oh, he blew his mind and he was just upset. 
And so he knows he's got to get right with God. You know, there's another 70,000 of my countrymen that lost their lives because of my stupid. That's a heavy weight to bear. Yeah. And so he says, man, I've got to get right with God. I've got to offer up a sacrifice. Well, he gets to Ornon's house and get this. Ornon's taken back because the king is at his house. Uh, well, most people would be, wouldn't they? And so King David, you know, tells him we need we need to offer a sacrifice here. And uh, you know, he's like, and David wants to buy the threshing floor, buy the place, buy the mountain, this part of the mountain. And he says to him, he said, Man, you ain't gotta buy nothing. You the king. You the king, man. Whatever you want, you know. I, man, I'm your subject. I'm just blessed to meet you. You know, you can you can use my land. You can do whatever you need to do. Now, David said something to him that would do us all well to memorize Amen. and to remember for the rest of our life. He said, How can I give to the Lord that which costs me nothing? How could I ever give to God something that wasn't a true sacrifice? He said, Man, I, I he said, I'm going to pay for this. And you, re, you read between the lines, he's telling me, I don't want to be, I don't want a King Dixie discount bargain neither. You know, I want to take care of this. I want to buy this. I want to take care of this. And so he does. And so, you know, it just is like, oh, well, you know. So, uh, you know, we have this history where Abraham offers, try, you know, he attempts to offer Isaac his son. Later on, you got Ornan, the Jebusite, selling King David this little piece. And then later on, you got this little tidbit in the Bible where it says, and then Solomon built the temple of God. Upon the place where David bought the threshing for Mormon. Wow. It becomes the Temple Mount. Now, I can tell you, I've been there, and I'm not saying that like in a braggadocious way, but I can just tell you, that is the most unusual place I've ever been. And you say, how so, brother? There are metal detectors everywhere. There are Israeli guards everywhere. It is the most tense place that I have ever been. And I've been in a few tent spots. Amen. <laughs> my cabin leg was coming up. My boat got stuck underneath the duck line. Amen. That's a pretty tense place to be. You know, but I'm telling you, this was tension, man. You could feel it. And you say, well, why was it like that? Why was it so bad? I'll tell you why it was so bad. The third most holy site in uh, the Islamic faith is up on top, on the rock. Whenever you see anybody being interviewed from Jerusalem, they're always going to be on the Mount of Olives, always looking back at the old city. You can always see the dome. It's a gold dome back there. That's the Islamic holy site, third most holy site in all of Islam. About from here to the highway, maybe a little further, is the old Wailing Wall. And that's what's the remnant of what was left of, of Solomon's temple, or the, the temple mount there in biblical days, Herod's temple. And so there it is, and you got Jews from all the world. Guess what? That ranks on their list. Did you see me put up my one before I, I asked the question to you? But the number one site in Judaism, number one, number one. And then about from here to... I don't know. Corvamai. Corvamai at the most is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And a half a mile is the other possible place for the crucifixion of Jesus. It's called Gordon's Calvary. So those three holy spots are within a half a mile of each other. Walking distance. And pilgrims from all over the world. Jewish pilgrims, Islamic pilgrim, pilgrims, and Christian pilgrims all converge on that temple mount. And they all look at each other sideways like, what you doing on my building? <laughs> every one of them, every person there, what you doing on my mountain? This mount is an amazing place. And it still has a great future. Yeah. I don't have time to go into this one. But the Bible says in two places. It says in two places. You know, the Bible says it once, you believe it. Amen. Amen. The Bible says it twice, you go shaking. Amen. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. Two different places the Bible says that, that this mountain will become the highest mountain in the area. Well, it's about 700 foot shorter than the Mount of Olives. 
So how in the world is Mount Moriah going to get on steroids and grow? How's that, how's that going to happen? Well, don't worry about it. It's going to happen. Well, I know how it's going to happen. Because Zechariah 14 tells us Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, the book says that the Mount of Olives is going to be split in half. He's going to make that sucker a valley, not a mountain. When he crosses it and goes up to Mount Moriah, it will be the highest peak. And when he preaches from it every day for a thousand years, it's going to be the highest mountain in which the Word of God is being put on. So, you know, here is, here is Abraham laying down the future, the future of Israel and the temple and our future as far as the millennial kingdom and Jesus reigning and ruling upon the earth. This is an important day. So here is old Abraham. Just so it's no wonder that God showed him the spot. God said, "Woo, this is over here." Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if he, you know, he put a glory light on it. I don't know how he did that, but he did it, and he let him know this is the mountain that I want you to go up to. This is the mountain that's going to be so special. And so the given son was a planned sacrifice. Last week I, I spoke quite a bit about the fact that, that God planned our salvation before He even made us. Before God created the world, He had a plan for our salvation. In 1 Peter 1.20, He indeed, Jesus, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Revelation 13.8, He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Not to belabor the point I made last week, but just to say it dramatically one more time and then move on. Before God said, let there be light, He said, let Him be crucified. He had a plan for our salvation. He knew that we were going to sin. He knew that we needed redemption. And this is His plan. And I can tell you, I don't care how liberal the world gets. I don't care how fussy they get about all kinds of good stuff. There is no plan B. Amen. There's just not no plan B. Oh, man, I'm telling you right now. He's not going to come up with another way. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Well, the third truth tonight, like Abraham, God gave His Son. You know, you ask the question, and you know, it, it, you know, it can't help but bother us a little bit. You know, why did this happen? Why would God test Abraham in this way? And all the text tells us is that God tested Abraham. There were the, the, uh, the, the Canaanites who were around them. They were sacrificing their children through the fires of Molech. And so here is, here is Abraham. You know, Abraham, how much do you love me? I know you've seen this. Have you wondered? Have you wondered? And so here he is with his great love. Here he is with his great faith. He did have great faith. We read that and we slowed down to read it, didn't we? So he told his two helpers, he said, you boys wait right here. We're going to go and worship. And what? We're coming back. We're coming back. Did you know the writer of Hebrews explains what happened there? The writer of Hebrews, maybe Paul, probably Paul, he says to us, look, the reason, the reason that he told those men we're coming back is because he knew that if God required him to sacrifice his son, that that son was the promise and that God was going to keep his promise. That that son was God's word to him and he knew that God was going to keep his word. Let me shut up and tell you what he said. He said if he that makes me kill him, he's going to raise him up. Amen. Amen. Right. There's going to be a resurrection right here. Right. If I have to take this boy's life, God's going to keep his promise and he's going to raise this boy back up. Abraham fully believed Amen. that if the sacrifice he had to go through with it, that God was going to raise him up and he and Isaac both would have a pretty good testimony to tell. Amen? Amen. Amen. Wow. Now, and now we get into some territory and you know, the only thing I can prove, the only thing I can prove is that, uh, is that Isaac was big enough to carry the wood. I proved that. That's right there in the text. Now, I've got two boys. And, you know, i got two boys, Rambo and Turbo, uh, Dumb and Dumber, Catch and Release. Have I ever told y'all what happened on that? Catch and Release. Yeah, yeah, Catch and Release. They were, they were in a bass fishing tournament. Lance caught a bass that he says, you got you got to incorporate the spirit 20% of the exaggeration. But he said it would weigh 10 pounds. 
and putting it into the bag, you know, the way bag where you go up and all that. Jason, uh, Jason dropped him. In the, Jason, Jason jumped off the board. <laughs> I'm trying to catch that fish. I'm just going to wrangle that sucker. I'm just going to wrestle it back out of water. <laughs> and, I, and I'm telling you, in the course of their life, that they are 40 and 38 years old, and I've heard stories that they've got upset at each other uh, a few times, but I've only seen it twice. And that one there, Lane's pouted for two, three weeks. Well, we were living with Jason. We had just started the church. If you want to have life on steroids, man, if you want the good life, go, go sponge off your kid, man. That is so awesome. You start a church, hey, son, we got a place to live. That is so awesome to go, you know, sponge off your kids, man. That's, that's, that's awesome living. And so yeah, I'm telling you, Lane's pouted for two weeks, man. I didn't think he was going to get over it. I thought I was going to have to get you. I got involved in that deal. You got to get them boys back on the right deal. So I, I called them catch and release. And Lance didn't like it. <laughs> so I went back to calling them dumb and dumb. But I can just tell you that, you know, I, I know how old boys have to be to split wood. I got in trouble over that one, Eric. I, my, I told them to go out there and split some wood, showed them how to do it, came inside. You said, well, you just trusted them? No, I want to see the show. I want to see the show. <laughs> so I got on my hands and knees in my bedroom, and I was peeking out the window watching them split wood, bounce that axe. Oh, just, no. just bouncing that axe off of that, you know, off that wood. I mean, you, you know, they ain't splitting no wood. And I was going to go out there and split some wood, show them how to do it. You know, it was a perfect day, right? So, you know, here I am in the bedroom laughing, man. I'm down on the floor, man, just just laughing, and she came in and caught me. She came in. What's so funny? Oh, I don't know, man. Ain't nothing funny. <laughs> nothing to see here. Nothing to see. She looks out the window and sees them poor boys out there, you know. So I can tell you, man, they up around, I don't know, man. They, they was probably 10 and 12, something like that. These boys, this boy's pretty big. He's pretty big. I can't tell you how old he was, but I can just tell you. He was able to outrun a hundred year old man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for clearing me up, man. He was an old sucker. I just tell you that right now. But he was 75 when he got the promise. And it went a long time before that thing got fulfilled. I mean, he's over a hundred years old, man. And I'm telling you right now, I, I know for a fact that I tried to outrun my nine year old grandson. It's been about six months ago, and he passed me up so bad he turned around and last the last part, ran the last part of the race backwards, sticking his tongue out at me. I can tell you, I can tell you, this boy could outrun Abraham. And I'm gonna tell you what, man, I don't know how feeble Abraham was. I don't know, you know, I don't know about the chronological years of this whole deal. I don't understand everything I know about it. But I can tell you this right now, there's no hands down deal that Abraham was able to whoop that sucker either. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I always thought Isaac was the valley between the mountains. That's another nickname for my boys. See the grandkids and other me. That's the mountains. Valley between the mountains. Y'all catch up in a minute. And I always thought Isaac just wasn't much to him. And boy, this story made me change my mind. I can't prove it. When we get to heaven, you can ask him. Come find me. I'll be on my picking porch. You know, you can come find me and brag one way or the other. But I'm thinking Isaac kind of went along with this. Now he tied him, so you know there was something to that. There's there's a piece of evidence there. But I, I think I think Isaac might have had a little something in on this. And you say, how could that possibly be? Who volunteers for death? I'm going to tell you something. He watched that old man live his life before God. Amen. And he knew what kind of faith he had. And I'm just thinking, here's what he thought. I'm thinking what he thought was a book. Dad, you think this is what's got to happen? Then I guess this is what's got to happen. I don't understand it. Don't like it. But if this is the way it's supposed to be, I see him getting up on the altar of this. Now, can I just tell you, man, what an amazing thing that was going on here, that this was a very, very special son, and like Abraham, 
uh, you know, here he was. But here's the last truth tonight. Unlike Abraham, God had no substitute. Abraham had a substitute, the angel of the Lord. Now, you know who that is, right? I've preached here long enough to tell I've told you who that is. Who is that? That's Jesus. That's the pre-incarnate Jesus. He does only things only God can do. He knows stuff only God can know. Okay? So here is the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, and then from heaven, listen to this, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. Boy, he was glad to hear a voice, wasn't he? I mean, he's just about to draw that knife. And he said, do not lay your hand on that lad or do anything to him. And there you see the true heart of God. For I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Don't do it, man. Don't do it. And then he provided for him a substitute. And so Abraham looks up. What does he see? He sees a ram over there in the thicket, over there in the briar patch. And he's so hung up in the briars that he's, he's, he's stuck there. He's easy pickings, man. Abraham, all he's got to do is go over there and take his life, and you know he's ready to sacrifice this lamb. I'm going to tell you something. <coughs> this is beautiful. Wasn't going to be the last time that a lamb had a crown of thorns on his head. Amen. That's good. And the guy who's hollering from heaven is the lamb. <coughs> Don't don't hurt that boy. Look over. Look over. I got you ran there in the bushes. I got you sacrificed. This is a story of commitment. A story that blesses us even now. But we gotta wrap up the end of the story and not miss the most important truth. There would not be a substitute when God gave his son. That's right. There's not gonna be anybody that can step in for Jesus. You know, we sang that song, one of those songs a while ago. It says, I looked through heaven, you know, and found a Savior. Well, that's Revelation 4 and 5. It says, who's worthy? Who's worthy to unleash the seals? Only Jesus. John cried because nobody was worthy. Nobody was worthy. And then one of the elders said to John, don't cry. Look, the Lamb has prevailed. To open the seals thereof. <laughs> you remember when Moses, you know, remember when he, when he offered to take the place of the people in their sin? Yeah. He said, Lord, forgive them. And if not, blot my name out of the book which you've written. Let me take their place. Amen. That was awesome. That was a majestic, wonderful thing that Moses was willing to do. But he wasn't, he wasn't qualified. Y'all understand that? Paul did the same thing in Romans chapter 9. He said, I wish that I could be accursed for the sake of my people, the Jewish people. If I could die and go to hell and then go to heaven, we'd make it happen right now. Well, that's beautiful and wonderful and dedicated and evangelistic heart and passion and pursuit and all kinds of stuff. But Paul wasn't qualified. Nobody in heaven, nobody on earth, only Jesus is the qualified redeemer. Amen. He's the only one that can be the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you're here tonight, Miss Brenda's going to come and play for us. If you're here tonight and want to get saved, man, that would be really great. We can lead you in salvation, tell you what you need to know, pray with you.